Once again, good morning. It's good to see you. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving and are getting ready for Christmas. I think when I think about Christmas and the Christmas season, what I look forward to a lot are the films that we get to watch during the Christmas season. Either the new ones that Hallmark is churning out. It's like 44 or some odd movies this Christmas season. Or for those that we retrieve and say we want to watch these again and again. And the arguments about whether Die Hard is a Christmas movie or not, officially, decide amongst yourselves. Um, I think we watch movies because it helps us to get into the holiday spirit. It also helps kill some time because we're indoors a lot uh, with people during the Christmas season. So sometimes a movie is something that is just what the doctor orders uh, when things are a little tense around the household. But I loved a few years ago, first time that my kids and I got to watch Home Alone for the first time. I remember watching Home Alone as a kid in a crowded theater, and so it was good to kind of pass the tradition on to our kids. And if you've seen the film, you know that um, it's got an interesting plot, right? Uh, Kevin's a youngster, and he's mistakenly left home alone while his extended family goes to Paris for Christmas vacation. And he loves the time alone, gets to do whatever he wants, but there's a looming threat during the plot of the film where the wet bandits, a couple of home burglars are beginning to hit all the different houses on Kevin Street. And so he has to fend off these burglars with all the inventions that he can come up with, with all the the items that he has in his household. But that plot alone really has no moral truth to carry away and say, boy, I'm so glad I wasted two hours of my one and only life watching this movie, right? There's nothing really to learn in that flurry of activity, so the film directors had to smuggle in another subtle plot in order for us to learn something as we watch this film. And it's real subtle. It happens between Kevin and old man Marley in the film. If you remember the film, you know that old man Marley is a bit of a menacing character. He's like hauling around a trash can full of salt and he's shoveling the snowpack sidewalks of Kevin's or, you know, suburban Chicago street, and there's all these rumors about him, about he's the, the South Bend shovel slayer, that he had committed murder somehow in the past, and so everyone needed to avoid him. And so initially, Kevin is scared of old man Marley, but over the course of the film, old man Marley and Kevin become friends. And really, the rising action happens in the middle of a church service where they sit side by side and they talk about each other's families and the issues they have in their families and they are able to confide and to encourage one another and they become friends. And at the end of the day, old man Marley, spoiler alert, helps save Kevin from uh, the, the wet band as it tried to overwhelm him, right? And so Kevin had this initial vision of old man Marley, but over the course of the film, he, was, he had an opportunity to get a a closer look in his mind was changed. I think that's something that happens to you and to me as well. And we have a couple of superpowers as human beings. We have a few of them, but a couple of them that are worth lingering on this morning. One of them is that we can walk into a room and we can make a ton of calculations all at once with our superhuman brains that we have. We, that, that helps keep us alive. It helps us to assess situations. And so we can walk into a room, we make calculations, and we respond because of thousands of stimuli in our previous experiences. But another superhuman power that we have is that we're able to reflect deeply on past events. I don't know why, but there's not a lot of creatures in God's world that can do this, but human beings can. We can recall details from things years and years ago. But this is where these two superpowers can overlap because we make calculations, we reflect on what we did and what we should have done, and then we make changes as we continue to reflect upon them. Perhaps an example would be appropriate. Imagine today you're watching football on the TV and you go into the kitchen to get an afternoon snack and you see that the refrigerator doors are flung wide open and remain there and that there's a faucet running in the kitchen sink but no one is there to be found. And instantly after making some calculations, you're like, this is not how it's supposed to be and you get angry and you get upset. You begin to say, who is the lazy person I said this a thousand times. You need to close the refrigerator door. You need to turn off the faucet after using the sink. I see some nudging of elbows to the person sitting next to you in the room this morning, right? And so you make this calculation. Who's a lazy person and what do I gotta do to convince them to do something differently? 
But then as you continue to calculate and observe, you look out the kitchen window to the backyard and you see your spouse kneeling with one of your kids at the base of the large tree in the backyard and they're putting band-aids on skinned up knees. And you make further calculations. Oh my goodness, this is what happened. My spouse is in the kitchen doing something. She heard something in the backyard. She's attending to our child after falling off a tree. She is not a lazy person like I thought in my first calculation. She is a hero for putting these things aside and attending to the thing that matters the most. Let the hearer understand and let's, uh, let's also ask some further questions. We can ask ourselves, why do I get so wound up when the refrigerator is left open and the faucet is left on to begin with? This is how these two things interact with our lives. We make calculations, but then we reflect on it, and then we ask ourselves deeper questions. How can I not make the same calculation again? This reminds me of a Blaise Pascal quote. He says this, all humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. If he was here today, he could update it and say this, and not check Facebook as they do so. Here's the translation. Our health depends on us taking some time to get quiet, to get alone, to journal perhaps, to reflect, to examine why do I do the things that I do? And how can I make some calculations along the way to do things better? So we seem to view the world with two different depths. And it's something that for, uh, John does in 1 John chapter 1. He begins to illustrate this a little bit very subtly in the biblical text. In the very first verses, John is trying to prove that he's an eyewitness to Jesus. This is what he says to open up his letter. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. Scholars note that when John is ticking off the senses of eyewitness, he only mentions once the sense of hearing and the sense of touching. But when it comes to the sense of seeing something, he repeats himself. He says it twice. Now, John is not being redundant. He is not trying to pad the word count on his letter in order to get a passing grade for an assignment. Because if we go back to the original language, we see two different words here. There is a word for seeing something where you observe it. But then there is a word for seeing something when you behold something. You cherish it. You contemplate about it at a greater depth. You and I do this from time to time in life. Perhaps it was during our Thanksgiving celebration with all of our family and the room was crowded and it was chaotic and we were kind of near that turkey coma type experience and there's like a football game on and they're roughhousing, like the cousins are roughhousing in the front room and everyone's there and all of a sudden, instead of just like seeing what was going on, you say to yourself, man, I really love this family. Yes, Sure, Aunt Susie can be loud at times, but I still really love this family. So we're seeing things at two depths. We're observing the room, but we're also meditating on something deeper. This happens on the other side of the coin too. We fall prey to it. If you've ever raised a kid, or if you're, if you're watching a grandkid grow up, you know that it goes by so fast, all the days and years, right? Like one day, like you're changing the diapers and then you leap forward and they've got like the loose tooth thing and then the next thing you know, they're 16 years old asking for the car keys so they can go on their first date. You're like, where did the time go? But in reality, like we've, we've been, we observed them all these years. But perhaps if we were to be honest, we weren't beholding this child in our lives at the depth that we could have because of priorities that were getting in the way or busyness or other things that were going on. And so time has simply vanished. And we wondered, where has the time gone? 
Well, this morning we have to find an answer to this dilemma, and I think that we're going to find it in our text from John chapter 1. But before we get there, let me introduce our sermon series through the month of December as we get to Christmas. We're calling it Locust and Honey and Yuletide, because we are going to cover the life of John the Baptist. If you can remember, if you're familiar with this story, his, his meals were of locusts and wild honey. He was like the OG paleo diet guy, like the very first one. But he was a forerunner to Jesus. He prepared the way for Jesus to arrive the first time. And so we think that we can look at John's life and his message this time as we prepare for Jesus at Christmas. Because what we find as we look at John's life that there are significant moments where his eyes were open to encounter Jesus at a deeper level. And so we're gonna distill these important moments of John's life into four different events, and we're calling them a Christmas wish list. Much like the wish list that you're kind of working down as you get all your presents ready to go for Christmas Day, if John had a Christmas wish list to see God more clearly, these are the things that he would wish for. And so we're gonna cover them one by one in the coming weeks. So the very first list item is, number one, a closer encounter with Jesus. So let's start with talking about who John the Baptist was. John was an important figure in first century Palestine. And there wasn't a big market for people to write about John because of where he came from and who he was. But much is written about John inside the Bible and outside the Bible. The New Testament tells us that he was a prolific character. He had a great ministry. It says that people were constantly streaming from the different towns of Galilee and Jerusalem and the area of Judea to the Jordan River in order to be, be baptized by him and to listen to his preaching. Even outside of the Bible itself, we have these, one of these rare moments where an extra biblical source like Josephus tells us about the life of a biblical character. So in Josephus' book, Antiquities of the Jews, this is what he says about John the Baptist. John was a good man and he commanded the Jews to exercise virtue both as to righteousness towards one another and piety towards God and so to come to baptism. Once again, this is a stunning feature, but for Josephus to take space to talk about John meant that John really had a significant impact in the world around him. We know from the New Testament Gospels that John and Jesus were related. They were distant relatives of one another. And so we have to assume that John was aware of the extraordinary events around his own birth and the birth of Jesus. That somehow you would have caught wind of all these things of angels showing up and magi from the east and all these crazy things happening when Jesus arrived, but time had passed. They were just mere young kids, babies, infants when we saw them earlier in the Gospels. So we fast forward to where both of these men were in their early 30s. John is baptizing by the Jordan River and Jesus appears to him. And during this passing of time, Perhaps John had forgotten about Jesus. Or perhaps he didn't have all the details about who Jesus was going to be. Because we get some peculiar words from John according to John chapter one, verses 29 through 34. This is what John says as he encounters Jesus when they're both grown-ups along the bank of the Jordan River. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, a man is coming after me who is far greater than I am for he existed long before me. But notice this next phrase. I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but I've been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. We continue on. Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. I did not know he was the one but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testify that he is the chosen one of God. We have a, we have a complex picture here. John is aware of all that happened at the birth of Jesus. But when he actually encounters him, a few decades later, some new downloads, some new information comes into his mind about who Jesus was going to be. So how, how do we put this picture together? One way to do so is to look at how complicated knowledge can be. A couple philosophers, Ali Hassan and Richard Fumerton, 
distinguish knowledge into two different categories. There's one category of knowledge by description, and there's knowledge by acquaintance. Now, this is a subtle difference between pieces of information, but I lean upon John Ortberg, who's a Christian author and thinker, to help us to distinguish between the two. This is how Ortberg gets through in the middle of this picture. He says, I have a knowledge by description of the city of Moscow in Russia. I've never been there before, but I could read some books about Moscow. I can see some reporting that comes from Moscow about world events. I watch movies, probably spy, American spy movies, where it takes place somehow in Russia each time, and I can see the buildings that are there. And so with those pieces of information, I can describe a little bit about Moscow. But my information about Rockford, Illinois, where I come from, is different. I could tell you what the air smells like after a thunderstorm in the summer. I could tell you what the pancakes taste like at the Swedish Inn restaurant because I've been there before and I've had them. I haven't been to Moscow. But I could tell you so much because of my immersive experience in Rockford, Illinois. The difference between information is important because it raises lots of questions and even some concerns for us in our faith. We have to then suggest that people can have a knowledge by description about who Jesus is, about what it means to be a Christian, about how Christians think and how a Christian lives out their faith in the world around them. But there's a difference between a knowledge by description and a knowledge by acquaintance. And the troubling thing is, is that the temptation to stop short with just a knowledge by description of Jesus and not to go all the way to acquaintance, that temptation is real and is for all of us no matter how many times we've been in a church service. I tell you this with honesty and with sincerity because that was a bit of my story. Growing up, I went to church because my family did. And I admired people who had great faith, but if I were to be honest with us this morning, I had a ton of questions after I listened to sermons and Bible teachings about the Bible and about faith and about Jesus. But since I was a quiet and shy kid, I wanted to be polite, I never raised those questions to anyone who might be able to give me an answer. But I tried to seek those answers out myself and since I was coming up short, I was beginning to make a calculation. Then when it was time for me to make my own decision about whether to go to church or not, I was gonna fade into the background ever so slowly so that I could do what I want, but not upset the people who cared about faith who were in my life. But about that time I was making that calculation, I met a group of friends in high school who had a deep and profound faith. They truly cared for one another and they cared for all their peers around them. At about that same time, I started to attend a church in a youth group where the spirit was alive and the preaching was enthusiastic and where the songs were sung with gusto. And I remember going Sunday after Sunday and listening to the sermons and being inspired. And I watched the lifestyle of people in that church and how they cared for me. How if I was gone a couple of Sundays and I came back, they would ask me sincerely how I was doing. I mean, these people really loved loved me. They loved me like my family loved me, but they weren't my family. So I came to the conclusion, their faith must be true because of how noble and honest and sincere their life was. And I put my trust in Jesus for myself during the middle of high school. But I also need to be honest that over time, as I became more familiar with the long history of the church story, and how diverse the body of Christ was, different than my own experience and expression of the body of Christ, it just raised more questions. And I began to ask myself, maybe there is something more than what I'm experiencing in my own little sliver of the Christian community. Now I need to confess to you that I love the church that I attended and the people that I attended with, but I had significant questions and I wanted to seek out their answers. And they weren't just questions on the periphery of the Christian faith about what Bible translation to use and so on and so forth, but critical and core questions about why Jesus had to come and die, about why did he say the things that he said and what did it mean and why did he do the things that he did and what did it mean? What did it mean then in the first century? And what does it mean for me as a 21st century person today? In the middle of my master's program while I was at seminary, I was able to take a New Testament class that changed the trajectory of my life. 
It was by an influential theologian and over the course of that one semester, he was able to truly show us the the broad breadth of the New Testament story. Through his scholarship and through the things that he experienced through his research and debate and push and pull from the guild of New Testament studies, he was able to show us the messages that come from the New Testament and the way that the Christian people lived their lives and what it meant for them and what it might mean for us as the church today. I remember taking some of this new information home to my wife Ginger and we had some vibrant discussions because of it. Now Ginger comes from an amazing Christian family. She's gone to church her whole life. She was the youth group all-star, man. Like she was there all the time. Like she was the long intern that they never paid for kids ministry. I mean, she was always there. She went to a Christian high school. She, when she went off to college, she went to a state school and instead of like what some of her friends were doing, she actually developed her faith intentionally throughout her years of, in her college years and she got an education degree. Instead of taking a teaching degree, she decided to go into ministry and so she joined up in a jail ministry here in Cedric County preaching the gospel to those who were incarcerated at the Cedric County Jail. So she had seen and heard everything by that point in her life. But when I brought these questions... And some of this new information home that I was experiencing through study, we began to pull on some loose threads, some gaps in our Christian experience. We began through a long discernment process of maybe investigating, maybe there's more than what we've seen up to this point. We had discussions and we prayed about it and we, we talked about all the different possibilities and there was one morning, we were having a hard time articulating all that God was doing in our lives, but there was one morning that after a time of prayer, Jesus, uh, Jesus spoke to Ginger and she, uh, when I got home from the church office that day, she pulled me aside, she said, I got something to tell you. She's like, I know that we've, we've gone to church for a long time and we've studied and we've prayed and we've practiced She's like, but for some reason, I've experienced Jesus at a brand new depth of faith that I've never experienced before. She says, what I've experienced this morning is that I think I can love him more than I can ever have imagined up to this point in my life. You might be asking, what was missing before that season of discovery and inquiry? Listen, Ginger and I, we're still young. We don't know much. We're still trying to figure things out. We still have a ton of questions. But if we were to try to diagnose what we thought was missing, it was simply this, that in our previous church experiences, there was an exaggeration of the experience of afterlife that was mentioned more often than anything else with little to say about what happens between now and then. And there was also this exaggeration to only focus on the needs of individual Christian people instead of people who don't necessarily agree with us in our theological beliefs. And so as we were wrestling, we had a few questions that governed our quest. We asked the question, is there a gospel big enough for the everyday life, not just for the afterlife? And is there a gospel big enough to lift all burdens for every person in this world, not just for those who call themselves Christians? And these questions led us back into the New Testament text We trace these questions and their answers back to the words of Jesus himself. Over and over again, Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and eternal life. He mentions that more than anything else in his teaching, which are all synonymous according to New Testament scholars. And if we put all those references together side by side, and if we do some grammar work on all these references where Jesus talks about the main point of his preaching, The majority of them, the overwhelming majority, 90% of them are in the present tense, not in the future tense. What it means is this, Jesus was obsessed with what God was doing in the here and now, not just in the far beyond. Jesus knew that God was breaking into the world around us, that something through his teaching and his preaching and his healing and the ways that he was doing things, the way that he suffered on the cross and was raised from the grave, it all was culminating in God's dream for the world around us. The Christian message from the very beginning was not, let's escape this place so that we can experience eternal life in a different place. That wasn't Christian sermon. That was Plato's sermon in the first century world. The Christians believed that God was redeeming the mess of this world from the very heart of it in this world around us. They had a zip code driven gospel, not a gospel just for the far beyond. 
So as Ginger and I was, we were reflecting upon this again and again, we started to make some course changes in the way that we saw the scripture, the way that we worshiped Jesus, and the hopes that we had for our children as we raised a family one day. This is what John Orbrick says about this idea about the kingdom of God. He says, this is eternal life. It is not something far away in outer space so that we can only hope to experience after we die. It is not simply being able to give the right answer at church, affirming the right doctrines, or even achieving the minimum entrance requirements to cross over the bridge and get into heaven. The gospel, of, the gospel Jesus preached is the good news that this eternal kind of life is available right now by grace, through Jesus, forever and beyond death. Dallas Willard, who was the teacher of John Orberg, he said this, and he says the same thing, but just in a shorter paragraph. Eternal life in the individual begins, does not begin after death, but at the point where God touches the individual with redeeming grace and draws them into a life interactive with himself and his kingdom. I confess to you that this is the experience that John had on the edge of the Jordan River that day. He had a hair standing up on the back of my neck experience when he encountered Jesus in real time. But perhaps he nearly missed it because of what he was expecting for the Messiah to be, what he was expecting for Jesus to do. This first awareness that John had is not the end destination for him. It wasn't, it's not the end destination for us. But this first encounter, this acquaintance encounter with Jesus begins to pour over into every compartment of our lives until all of our life is consumed with the sense and the awareness that we're part of God's people and that we're in the middle of God's plan. But this begs the question, how do I get there? How do I flee from just having a descriptive knowledge of who God is? How do I cross over into this type of knowledge where I can have an acquaintance with the Lord our God? With that, I wanna borrow a metaphor that Mike Frost, who's the theologian, this is what he uses when he talks about this dynamic. He says that we need to have soft eyes in our Christian faith. Uh, detectives in law enforcement, they go to a crime scene and they try to look for clues about the story about what happened in the room. Now when they first start out, they've been to school but they've never been to a crime scene so everything is new. And so they begin to learn things along the way, crime scene after crime scene. They begin to build a database of things to look for, things that they didn't know before. But they've studied detectives over time and they realize that even though they gain experience, they begin to miss things that they know they should have seen. That's because they reach an inflection point. They begin to rely upon their previous experience and not on what's actually there. They develop a tunnel vision to only see what they want to see and to not see what's actually there. So over time they develop a mantra and it's this. They ask for soft eyes to see this crime scene like the, the first crime scene they ever witnessed in their experience. Trying to broker this interesting paradox of experience and naivete so they can lean on the power of their experience but also be open to new things that they haven't quite seen before. I think that we need to have soft eyes in our faith too because no matter how experienced as a Christian we can be, we can also get tunnel vision to only see what we want to see. And the danger of that is what we read in the stories of Jesus again and again, page after page in the Gospels, is that Jesus will often operate on the fringes of society, on the edge of our experience, and not in the tunnel that we've created for ourselves. So we will miss Jesus unless we crave to have the experience of having soft eyes again. But then that begs another question, how do I get soft eyes? Well, that takes a lot of work. It takes a commitment to being open to new things again and again. So what I've done is I, over time, I've, I got a couple of examination questions from Dallas Will that he gave to his students. And this is something that I do every single month. On the last day of the month, at noon, I've got a reminder, an alarm on my phone that opens up a box to these two questions. And I get alone and I wrestle with these two questions because the answer of them get to the heart of my current Christian experience. This is what Willard said. 
Am I growing more or less easily irritated these days? Am I growing more or less loving these days? Examining ourselves with those two questions get to the heart of whether or not we're under the canopy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But maybe we could take it a little bit further. I see that we don't just want to like barely examine our lives, but if we want to do a thorough examination of how things are going, let me suggest a couple more questions. Are the sources that I regularly draw from making me more or less easily irritated these days? Are the sources that I regularly draw from making me more or less loving these days? Here's why these questions are important. Jesus gave a subtle warning in his preaching. At one point he said, what good is it if a person gains the whole world but forfeits their soul? Now I would suggest that forfeiting of the soul doesn't happen overnight. We don't just plan out on Tuesday and say, okay, I'm gonna make the Costco run on Monday and then Tuesday I'm gonna forfeit my soul. Like it doesn't happen like that. The forfeiting of one's soul, which is their life, happens with subtle agreements that we make over time that build up into the erosion of a life with God. So unless we examine ourselves regularly, we allow these agreements that we make over time because we haven't taken care to examine to work its way into our lives to where yes, we can go Sunday after Sunday, we could worship, we could say our prayers, but we're still easily irritated and less loving. And any source that makes us more easily irritated and less loving is not Christian, no matter how many Bible references they try to tack onto their message. Can I hear an amen? John nearly missed it because his eyes were in tunnel vision, I assume. But what a grace from God that in the moment where he felt like he had the math figured out, Jesus came and it opened up his perspective once more and he was able to see Jesus and start all the way over. That's gonna be my Christmas wish this month is that I have soft eyes so that I can have a close encounter with Jesus and I implore each of us to have the same disposition this Christmas season. Let's pray together this morning. God, we thank you that you are rich in generosity, that you love us with an everlasting love, that you hold us within your care and in your hands, that you never let the righteous fall. And so God, this morning, as we meditate on our own lives, we examine where we are, we try to diagnose the knowledge of you that we have, whether it's by mere description or if it's of deeper acquaintance. I pray that you would meet us here, that you would speak to us, that you would change our lives. God, we confess at times we have tunnel vision. We only want to see what we want to see. We don't want to be uncomfortable. We don't want to be surprised. We don't want to be wrong. But God, this day I pray that you would give us the grace and courage to open up our view, to not just see you, but to behold you this Christmas season. And so have our lives changed because of it. I ask all these things in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. At this time, I invite us all to stand together.